Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to Screw the Cubicle TV. I'm, of course, Lydia Lee, the founder and corporate escape coach from ScrewTheCubicle.com. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for another conversation about living an unconventional life and getting the inspiration you need for your own career reinvention and life transitions. So in today's series for the Corporate Escape Stories, I am so excited to interview Elaine Siu an ex-finance lawyer who reinvented her career to focus her strengths towards a cause that she was passionate about. So Elaine started the first 100% cruelty-free, vegan, eco-conscious beauty e-commerce platform that's now based in Hong Kong with a vision to expand across Asia. So being able to utilize her lawyer skills and then mixing it with passion, her passion for animal welfare, she's really created an amazing business called Get Minimal, which is getminimal.com. So I wanted to bring Elaine on the show today to not only share her story of how she did sort of a complete 360 on a career direction, but also the fears that she overcame uh, from branching out of what she knew, you know, what was in, uh, from her degree and her journey to honor her passion of transforming how people buy conscious products. So welcome to the show, Elaine. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Of course, and we, we've had some connection issues before we started the interview, so I'm really glad we finally, half an hour later, uh, got to it. And, uh, you know, sometimes this stuff happens in Asia, more on my side than on yours, but uh, you had a storm last night, so maybe that was this part time of it. me. <laughs> Yeah. So um, yeah. just to give people some context about how we both know each other. So you and I met at my retreat two years ago and really lots have happened to you since then. Um, you know, this year you launched Get Minimal, uh, which is one of the business ideas that came from the retreat. But for people who didn't see that journey and wasn't obviously a part of that retreat um, with us, why don't you start by first uh, talk, talking us out, right, through how you discovered your business idea for starting this e-conscious, uh, e e uh, sorry, eco-conscious e-commerce business? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's never really straightforward as an entrepreneur and we're going to talk about it um, in, this, in this interview, I'm sure, is that this is actually the second business idea that I have and have executed. So basically, um, I had two business ideas that kind of stand out during the workshop and I tried the first one and this is the second one. So um, I remember that was a really helpful exercise that we did in the workshop that I quite like to share here is that you yeah, remember please. we had like posts on walls, right? We did. And then there are three colors of posters. So you're supposed to put your interest or passion and the, the second one is the skills that you have and the third one is what problems in the world need solving. So that, that was really it for me, like, because um, you put together these three things and you pretty much get a business that is quite specifically yours. Um, the sweet spot of having your interests, your skills and the market demand meet. Um, but what I have then discovered sort of along the way is that actually these three things, at least for me, there, there is sort of a priority. And for me, definitely your not really just interest, but your passion, like something that you really, really believe in, that definitely comes first. And I mean, because the, the reason why that always comes first is that that leads the way, like in terms of what skills you have, when you know what you want to do, like what's your passion, what's the belief system that you have, you then can create a business model that can utilize your skills, right? So you don't like let your skill set go first and limit what you can do, but you fit your skill set into what you're trying to achieve. And then the third thing is the market demand, which I struggled with that for a long, long time. Well, still struggling with it probably, but I think any entrepreneur would know that the market demand thing is really like a trial and error thing that it's you no just go through. Yeah, and, and you don't get it before you set up your business. You kind of have a faint idea of what it is, maybe, hopefully it's out there, and then you do it, and then you sort of um, know more and more, and you readjust your direction and everything. So, so among those three things, I think what I've learned is, is that, that there is actually, a, a, for me, um, the why definitely comes first. Yeah, I think, I think it's so, so good that you said that because I, I think a lot of the times when people even start to discover what is something they're passionate about, a, a lot of it is backed by a why, isn't it? Whether we, we know it right away or not. 
you know, and I remember at the retreat, you were always talking about your love for animals and, and, but you don't want to be sort of this nonprofit, you know, person, uh, you still want, want mm -hmm. to be able to give back in some way, but do it strategically where your efforts and your work is still being rewarded, right? You're not interested in just, yeah. um, constantly this nonprofit for profit thing, even though what could happen is that you could actually monetize an idea and, and then could donate money, you know, for example, to a cause, uh, that you believed in. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of your why, because as you mentioned, this is, this is, was such an important part of your um, sort of deciding on, on which ideas to back, right? Which ideas to put the effort and the time into. And I know a big reason that you're putting a lot of energy and focus on Get Minimal, right? Which is the, the e-commerce platform you have right now, because it really aligns with your big why, with it, which is this huge piece of, of helping animals. So can you tell us why this is so important for you to find that bigger purpose first? And how has that really fueled the way that you built Get Minimal? Um, has it affected the mm -hmm. check-in, for example, on the vendors that you allow in your website? Do they have to also be very aligned with your why? What were some of the things you did to make sure that everybody and everything that's involved with Get Minimal is aligned with that big purpose? Oh, I love the way you ask your questions. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I think number one, why is the why so important? It's because honestly... In my opinion, without the why, I don't know why anyone would want to be an entrepreneur, seriously. I mean, because it's so hard. Like, relatively, it's so easy to be an employee, seriously. Um, without a huge purpose backing you up, there are a million ways you would quit it, like, at any time. Um, and I also think that it helps a lot when that purpose is beyond yourself. That, that big why is much bigger than yourself, then, um, yeah, it, it, it's just that bigger force that, that help you overcome any struggle, which is like every single day, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so that helps a lot. But also, um, I love your question because it brought out something that I didn't really realize until now, is that it sort of made my business easier or managing or positioning my business easier because now I, I've been sort of in business really launched it for only three four months now and I have over 16 brands on my platform already that 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 it's a marketplace idea and people ask me like it's your first time in business like how did you get like 16 people you know at least believe enough in you and they are quite decent brands like how did you get them on your platform and mm. my answer was that it wasn't that, that difficult like at all and now that i look back i mean i'm super grateful for those people having faith in me i mean before i had a website i just sent these people cold emails with proposal mm. saying that i have no business uh experience i was a lawyer for 11 years and that's about it i work in a big institution you know and so this is like i have no nothing to back up what i'm saying <laughs> like, really but I'm really passionate about this and my relevant experience really is in the animal welfare work that I've done for years. And if there is one thing that I can promise people is that I bring integrity into the picture mm. and integrity is the whole reason I'm doing this. So, I mean, I'm not going to promise you any sales figures and you know, some people would just go, Oh, this chick is crazy, right? I don't want to be doing business with her. But then because I have this really clear stance that this is not about money for me. I have not made much money for anyone, like no track record. If you want to join me, it's because you trust that at least I have integrity mm. and I have a vision. So if you want to join me, join me. If you don't, then don't, right? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> so pretty much what you like. <laughs> yeah, I love that you say that because I think a lot of new entrepreneurs get stuck in this place. Of if I've never done it before, then no one's going to trust me and I don't have this credibility. And I love that you were honest about that this is your first time starting something, but here's what I can offer, right? Here's what you can rely on me for that's going to allow your brand mm. to be showcased 
to the right audience that actually needs to find you yeah. uh, maybe didn't want to do all that Googling, you know, of that standard of yeah. conscious products that they're willing to buy. Because as you and I both know, exactly. there's lots of products that call themselves green these days, but what, who is standardizing them in a the sense of really a neutral party like yourself, mm. really curating those people, but actually ensuring that the standards they have to meet of what is your standard of, of eco-conscious and, and that honesty that you, you reveal, right, in part of your, your selection process mm. um, is, is sort of helping people buy consciously, which I, which I really, really like. Um, and you didn't let the yeah. I've never done business before thing stop you. You were saying, well, I have done corporate experience being a lawyer. I know the legal parts of launching a business and I have the passion, right, of linking your brands up to people who want to buy this way. You know, this is what you can rely on me for. And I think that is a big sell. That is a good pitch in a way and allowing them to um, come in with your story, you know, to, to align their story with yours. And if they see this common value, I think that they share with you, that is a, a, a good, a good partner, you know, that believes in the same things that you do. Um, so yeah, exactly. And that makes my life much easier because it's, it's the whole, what kind of person you are, you attract the same persons, right? And so I attract people who don't just talk to me about, I want this sales figure by what, you know, whatever date, if not, I'm gone. You know, the, none of these people are doing business with me. I don't have to deal with those people. And these like sellers or vendors on my platform right now they're like yeah take your time you know you're doing great and I mean it's it's so nice doing business with them and I mean people seems to look at business in a very narrow way in that we just talk money 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 right mm. but I think the way that the future of business is going is that no you, you I mean I'm only interested in for purpose business or social business or whatever you call it these days um and I try to attract people, same like-minded people who do business with me. And therefore, I won't just be chasing sales numbers because that's not what those people are looking for when they team up with me, collaborate with me. So yeah, yeah that definitely um, make my, my life much easier. I love that. Yeah. So, so when you were first starting out, you know, as you said, this is sort of the second idea you were experimenting with, the second idea that you, you launch. And, and so... What did, you know, coming from the first idea to the second idea uh, of what, what it is today, what did you have to sort of overcome in terms of fears or self-doubt um, to be able to sort of launch the second business for yourself, possibly going through a change of heart or a shift in intention from your first business? Um, and was there any part of that journey for you that you sort of went, holy crap, like how am I going to turn my legal, you know, my, my legal side of my experience and use it as a contribution to this new business? Yeah. I mean, that holy crap thing happens every single day, once again. You know? <laughs> but I, I think it will naturally, like, when you've done, so, so I think my experience probably would resonate a lot with, like, corporate professional people, as in, if you've come from a 300 people company, like, your whole career, rather than, you know, I've worked in a three people company my whole life, kind of thing so that whole institutionalized having having a lot of uh, system in place backup etc like like that's where I came from and I've thrown myself in like the other the other end of the spectrum so I think my experience probably would resonate with those people a lot and um, I mean there are a lot, a lot of things that are now in me that kind of shine through without me knowing so for example the professionalism it seems like people actually really see that coming through without me trying to you know put the lawyer thing into it it just comes through even if i write an email so so that helps and um the whole integrity thing um so because i'm a perfectionist and also like as a lawyer, there's this due diligence kind of that. That's one of my skill set. And that I definitely apply in my business right now. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, don't, if you have that skill as part of you, you will put it in use some way 
um, you have to get everything that you have inside you when you become an entrepreneur and mm. put it to you. So don't even worry about that part. But um, if you ask me what I need to overcome, basically, um, looking back, my first business was um, writing a book and going like the self-development kind of business model. I don't even know what, what that was called, but that was really written for me. I mean, right. you know, I wrote that book called The Seven Habits of Highly Stuck People. Highly Stuck People, that was me. And the yeah. seven habits that I had to get, like let go of, that was for me. So I, looking back, the first business, I had to have my first business to lead me into my second business because mm. I had to write a book for myself to overcome all those things yeah. before I can launch into my second business. And I think the biggest um, thing was the belief system that we've been fed like by society, our employers, our parents, etc., for decades and generations. Um, that is the thing to overcome. And one of the biggest thing is the fear of failure. And you really can't have that as an entrepreneur. I mean, but I was not only driven by the, that fear in everything that I did um, in, in my life, but also I was so good at preventing failure. Right. I mean, I was a lawyer, so I was supposed to go into a situation, um, assess the risk and manage it and preempt bad things from happening, right? So that's like my skill set as a lawyer. So... I mean, there are a lot of things in life you can't control, but to be honest, if you're smart about it, you can position yourself like you can position yourself such that failure becomes a very slim chance. And that's, that was what I was really good at doing. But also living life like that puts you in a very small box. Mm. That's what I've discovered. So give and take if like you can preempt failure pretty much like I managed doing that for many years but then your life becomes smaller and smaller and smaller mm. and so I had to oh, that's the biggest thing I had to overcome um, mm. is to know that failure is okay and how to stand up after failure is more important than yeah. preempting failure yeah because yeah. in a way the learning pieces right of whether self-development and self-growth and business growth comes from doing things wrong, quote unquote wrong, or making a mistake or failing, and being able to use that information that has happened to improve it, right? And that's sort of how you make bigger things. And so without mm. failure, it's sort of hard to even know what to do next sometimes because there's no context <laughs> to things. And I think as humans... Yeah, yeah. You know, you and I have had this conversation before, uh, coming from a background, you know, I'm, I'm from Malaysia originally, you're obviously from Hong Kong. There's this sort of Asian mentality mm -hmm. of straight A's all the time. You, you don't ever fail. It's an embarrassment to tell anyone that you need help. You know, it's sort of the cultural thing that we've grown up to believe is true. And so, yeah. so it's, it's sort of our, both of us, I think, went through the, a very similar um, overcoming a fear of, of, of redefining fear, right? To say fear is there and it's not about avoiding it, it's always gonna be there. Uh, but maybe I can look at this differently where I can, I'm not dead you know, from this fear, I'm still breathing. I'm probably luckier than most of 80% of the rest of the world to even be able to take a stab at this, you know? Um, and how can I use this, this situation you know, to better what I do rather than be, be held back by it, right? Which is absolutely a mindset shift, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, as you were going through this journey of learning how to, so you remember how you said, I've never done a business before. I've never made anyone money before, let alone myself, right? Um, you know, what, what you were probably being able to, you know, if you were researching about business or even researching competitors or researching what you should be doing, uh, there seems to be quite probably a lot of advice out there, right? There's always so many things that we think we have to do uh, to sort of be successful. So how have you been able to sort of discern what advice is right for you and for your type of business? And how have you learned to really trust like your inner guidance to know what's best for you and your business? Mm. Okay, so I am a hopeless people pleaser. So that is like, <laughs> it, it's been a really tough lesson. But now, uh, I think the biggest piece of advice I can give is that there's so much bullshit out there. 
There's mm-hmm. so much bullshit. Um, and so you have to be so careful with not only who you listen to, but who you allow to talk to you, basically. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, people just have something to say about whatever, whether they know about your situation or not. So um, that, 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 that is something that I had to learn the hard way. And also being a, a lawyer, i.e. an advisor in my previous role, right? Um, at least one thing that I understand is when you are a good advisor, the first thing you need to know is what you don't know. Mm. So be very, very careful whenever someone comes to you and say that you should do this, you should try that before they know anything about your business or you as a person. Yeah. And, and I mean, a, a lot of people tell me that, oh, you know, you, you learn from this coach or you try to, um, uh, uh, Cause, cause I'll be doing a master's degree in entrepreneurship very soon. And people will say, you should just talk to business people who have real ex- experience, blah, blah, blah. Right. But, um, what I have found is that, yeah, sure. People have real experiences and, and I mean, they all come from a really good place. Okay. Like they're yeah. not trying to like do something bad or anything. Um, they come from a very good place, but as an entrepreneur, your experiences are always very nuanced. Yeah. And very specific to your circumstances, specific to your case. I don't care how many years of experience a person has or how many businesses he had. All those experience are very case by case basis mm. and based on the specific circumstances. And, um, you know, it's good to listen to those people too, but I'm just saying they might not understand what you're going through, what they've been through might not actually apply to you. And mm. they don't have like people, people say like academia or coaches, they don't really have real experience. But what they have that real business people lack is that they put like hundreds and thousands of cases that they've seen mm-hmm. together and they yeah. build a system around it. And, and they like, they drill down to like, what is the common thing in yeah. these hundred cases and all these data right so um i tend to actually listen more to academia people coaches more than like real business people and also just just someone who recognizes how little he or she knows about you Mm. or your business like when a person knows what how limited his or her experiences or advice is that's the kind of people you you listen to because yeah. they like they are careful about giving advices and then they know their limitation. Yeah. So, and you're right. Yeah. Like, there isn't an expert about everything and there's so many moving parts about a business. Right. And, and I'm sure that when you were building your business, you found that, Hey, d- at different stages of your business and different problems that you have to solve in your business requires a, sometimes a different expert, you know, not one person can give us all the answers, right. Of what is necessary, right. For us to move forward with it. Yeah. But I love that. I exactly. Think- Yeah. The important point you made there was about like, make sure whoever you're getting help with understands how you want to run your business. Like the style that you have, the values and foundations that your business is built upon, which is in a way non-negotiable, right? Just like your purpose Mm -hmm. and your why that's not going to change. Business models can change. Customers can change. Products can change. But the thing that you stand by, the thing that people rely on you for, and the thing that is the, is, is the thing you believe in rarely changes, right? That's that sort of core rooted yeah, um, yeah. Um, piece of who you are. And, and every strategy and every plan and every um, blueprint or whatever that you think you need for your business has to be coming from and fueled by those values, right? To ensure that you're doing business in a way that feels genuine. Yeah, exactly. And the tips and strategies and things like that, um, you can Google it, you know, it's right. all over Google. You know, if you want tips, you just ask Google and they have the answer there. Um, and so I, I think if you're really looking for a mentor, um, you find someone who, yeah, goes to the core value of things, not just mm. telling you tips of, you know, how many times you need to post each day on Facebook page. Right. Those are like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so during this time of, of, of as you decided those, that, you know, that advice that's right for you, you picked the right path to go on. And obviously, this is a continuous process as you develop your business. Um, you know, 
what, what do you think were sort of the three things that have since happened to you since, let's say, from the retreat two years ago to now? Uh, what are your sort of top three things that you think made the difference for you to be able to launch this business and ha develop the clarity that, that you want for your purposeful business? Okay, I, I think there are three things. Um, one is what I've just talked about is to listen to a handful of good people only. Because <laughs> yeah. that, would, that would save you a lot of time and energies. Um, yeah. But of and, course, and wait, then you have to build up the pace. I was going to say, let me stop you there so that I can actually ask you another question there. Is how yeah. did you then choose your people? How did you, what were the sort of questions you had to ask to go, this person is the right person to ask advice from? Uh, that is an art, yes, and I'm still sort of developing that, that skill. Um, but as I said before, number one thing that I look at is um, how much does that person understand his or her limitations? Mm. So overconfident people, I don't listen to. Mm. <laughs> there was a thing um, they know everything. If I <laughs> So if, if I ask that person like two questions and she'd be like, yeah, you should do that, that, that. Instead of saying, you know, my experience in this is that blah, blah. And so with what I know, mm. this. And the second question, like, I actually don't know anything about this. So I cannot, like, then, like, that's how, pe how a person can build trust with me is that mm. you at least know what you don't know. And you don't just give out bullshit advice mm. to to whoever uh, so so that that is an important thing also obviously look at the background of what what they've done and and I also have um, I like talking like I hate small talks so I usually <laughs> talk to people and go into like super deep conversations so I kind of assess their intellect <laughs> mm. that way. yeah so but, but it is an art, but, but if there is one quick tip, like one super big red flag for me is that is, is people who are too confident and mm. think that they know it all and they've done it all. Mm. There is no such person. Mm. Yeah. So, so what's so the second thing that's, that made the difference for you to oh, yeah. make your business? Yeah. The second thing is um, something that I've discovered that's, in me and that has helped me a lot is that I'm a really quick learner and I actually really like learning things and I didn't know that that was so crucial in being an entrepreneur because uh, basically it is the flip side of being a corporate professional as a corporate professional one of the things that we've been trained in is that you cannot do everything yourself you have to learn how to delegate and learn how to manage people right mm -hmm. and as an entrepreneur damn i have no one to delegate anything to damn i got no one to manage i mean it's just me <laughs> so you have to be a really quick learner and learn everything that you don't know how to do and do it to a decent level and and move on to the next thing uh, so the eagerness to learn things and mm. the ability to learn it really fast is, is very important. And also to then let go of it because the world is moving so fast. So once you've like, sort of you think, oh, I've learned this, I, I'm doing this, yay. And then the world is like, well, that's gone. You know, let's move on to the next thing. And you're going to learn it again. And you'll be like, what? Um, but yeah, that, that's just how, how, how it is, I guess. Um, and then the third thing really, I think we keep coming back to this, but yeah, the, the big purpose. So, mm -hmm. um, that keeps you focused because, because I've talked about like all these noises, right? So other people that their opinion, you have to be really careful about and the world keep changing, which means you keep learning new things. That's kind of like these two adding together is like a very noisy like like you, you have to get your focus back and that mm. focus is down to like at the end of the day okay it's been a crazy day but why the hell am i doing this right yeah. and have i have i actually um 
lost my way um, in doing this or that. And, and you might think, that, okay, whatever, that's no big deal because that doesn't affect my purpose. So I'm not going to sweat about that. Mm. Or, you know, this I can actually not do, right? Or not give any priority to that because that doesn't affect my purpose. So that gives you the clarity and focus to, to go on and not be tempted to like try everything else that people say you need to do. Mm, yeah, I love that. And, and, and I think those are, in a way, when you were sort of saying that, I was like nodding. I'm like, yep, that, that insatiable curiosity <laughs> to learn. I'm still learning even five years down the, you know, the line of my own business. It's like constant. It's almost like sometimes too much learning and you need to get those ba- parent yourself in a way to go, oh, that doesn't apply to me right now. I can park that. I can file that in my Evernote, but I'm not going to read that Facebook ads strategy because I'm not doing Facebook ads right now, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. We have to sort of also keep a limit on learning, I think, because, you know, in the, in the world of the internet, it's just constant information, you know, entering our realm. And we have to learn, as you mentioned in the beginning of this interview, it's like learning how to create those boundaries, right? About who you let in into your mm-hmm. business, who you let in into your life as you transition uh, and, and be mindful about who you ask advice from, but also be mindful about how much you're filling your head with in terms of learning, because sometimes that could be um, also an addiction to being busy, you know, which a lot of us can do when we're overachievers, <laughs> overlearning as well. You know, <laughs> academics and things like that yeah. really fall into this trap uh, and myself included. So I love the three things you said. So to, to recap, the first thing is, um, as, as you mentioned, you know, learning to, write, to ask the right people for the right advice and, and trust your gut about who to trust, uh, but also yeah. to, to discern them by, by knowing that there's, they could be special, specialized in certain areas. They probably aren't people that know everything about everything and, be, and just trust yourself, right? How you feel. I think it's the same thing like when you meet uh, a romantic, you know, person, like you just feel it, right? Does this person get me? Do they think like me? Do they have values that are aligned with mine? You sort of feel that right away, right? When you meet somebody and to trust that, that gut feeling. Mm. And the yeah. second one you said it was just this like eagerness, right? This, this insatiable curiosity and willingness to learn because part of the entrepreneurship mm. process is always learning something new and being really um, okay with that and, and being a learner again, not being a know-it-all and actually uh, humble enough to learn and do things differently as things progress. Um, and then the mm. third part, which is the important piece, I think the driver of every intention and action really that you're going to be doing yeah. going forward is does everything I'm doing and putting my focus and energy on align with the bigger purpose of how I want to deliver this work. Right. And as yes. said, that helped you to say no to a lot of things, helped you to say yes to some things and, and going to bed at night, knowing that every decision you make is also a conscious decision for yourself. Right. Yes. Great. Yes, definitely. Awesome. So <laughs> Lastly, I want to ask one quick question because as you are in this first year of business and launching something that is such a big thing, like an e-commerce platform and having different vendors and different partners and different customers being a part of this community for you, um, it's a big feat, you know, it's a big launch. It's not just a service that you're launching, it's, it's, it has multiple moving parts, which isn't easy. So um, I would love to sort of know what would, you know, if you were to talk to the people watching this video right now, who are people who are new entrepreneurs possibly in that sort of crossroad of launching soon, right? Um, what should they anticipate experiencing when they first launch their big idea? So what are some things to watch out for or misconceptions that you think you want to bust? Um, and then what are some you know, mindset shifts or support systems you think is necessary for them to get ready so that they're not being a perfectionist and sort of doubting the process as they launch? Okay, this is a big one. A big um, question. <laughs> good question. Yeah. Simple answer to that is that however difficult you think the launch is going to be, it's just going to be more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> That's the honest truth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it is. And you're like, what? I've already expected the worst thing coming, right? How can I be in this deep shithole right now that I just like, it's beyond, <laughs> beyond any kind of imagination. Um, yeah, uh, uh, but you just kind of deal with it as, mm. as it comes. So, you know, whatever. And, and as you said, right, four months into my launch, I, I'm beginning to now pretty late realize how big this is and probably this is like way bigger than what I can handle I mean I'm just one person 
person. And I don't know why I'm doing this marketplace. I'm now understanding that this is totally not an e-shop. Like it's, diff- it's totally different. I'm dealing with Getting so bigger. many different yeah. moving parts and bodies. Mm. And which is the beauty of this business model, but also the challenge that, mm. that comes with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, just expect the worst try to be prepared but also know that you can't be prepared for everything mm. and i guess one thing that kind of keep me sane is that you know i'm not doing this entrepreneurial thing in the profession of, of um, a doctor let's say right like nobody died like at the end yeah. of the day right um, it can be all like can i say can i swear of course like fuck up yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love being interviewed by you. <laughs> it can be so fucked up, but nobody died. Yeah. Like, you know, so what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. If it's, if it's even the worst that can happen, it won't kill you, right? It won't kill your business. And I think you've found new ways to sort of bypass hurdles and you've learned something new every single time. Like we mentioned, but using failure as a way to improve and refine your methods. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that, that is the... the biggest thing to and and to be honest once you launch you don't have time to go worry about oh my god whatever you you just have to dive in and deal with it because things are happening so quickly you don't even have time to like cry about it or whatever Mm. so just yeah just take the leap Mm. jump (laughs) that's really the big thing but the other thing that um what was your question like to anticipate oh oh, yeah um the perfect Perfectionist thing. I know you yeah. talk about that a lot. Yes. And, and um, I am definitely a perfectionist. Uh, and I think there are two sides to it, right? I am, I am still a perfectionist when it comes to me and things mm-hmm. that I do. Like, I have a really high standard for myself. And I think that's okay. And I think also that's, well, as, as long as you don't kill yourself over it, it's fine because when you are launching your own business, you're doing your own things. Really, there's nobody but you who who sets the bar of, mm. of what standard you want to achieve, right? right? You are the only person setting that, that bar. So yeah, I'm a perfectionist. But um, where you cannot be a perfectionist, and I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm very frank. That's the, mm. the, that's the area that I struggle the most is when I employ people to help me. Um, mm. I have since learned that you cannot be a perfectionist there. Yeah. Um, in fact, you have to really, 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 really lower your expectations. <laughs> and that is the reality of a corporate professional is that um, we've spent years of working in huge institutions where people are super well trained and well paid and everything, right? And they go through an HR system to get, mm. and you don't pay them directly. So nothing is personal, right? right? A colleague or whatever, or someone working in your team under you, whatever, their crap. It's not personal yeah. because you are not actually paying a person out of your pocket, you know? You can be really mad, but I mean, all those like people management skills that I learned as a corporate professional doesn't apply to being an entrepreneur at all because once you are actually paying that person out of your pocket you know that whole theory just goes out of the window (laughs) all the standards are up here you don't let people make mistakes because you're like this is my dollar every penny exactly exactly and I find that not many people talk about that like how frustrating that is and also you have to and like usually as an entrepreneur, you're not paying people a lot, right? Mm. And then you look at, for instance, if I want to create a website and I look at, well, I want to look like Etsy.com. Well, right. seriously. Yeah. Like Etsy had like millions of dollars investment. Right. Yeah. And I don't know, a team of 30 people to manage the site. And, and you want to pay like peanuts to one person, <laughs> freelancer, and who would want to work with you, by the way, and you want to create Etsy.com, I mean, seriously. So I, I, I think that's, that was my biggest challenge to, you know, understand the reality, but still in, in what I can do myself, try to reach that perfectionist standard. Mm. But in everything else, I, I need other people's help to do. How can I manage to like still have something, you know, decent and, and can serve its purpose? but without having that perfectionist in me killing me killing that person or even mm. killing the business 
you can become so yeah. frustrated that you know if if not this then i don't want anything mm. but, but you, you can't have that mentality so i mean be a perfectionist when you can and when you need to and, and stop being a perfectionist when you know when it wouldn't work <laughs> yeah and also because you know in the beginning as you mentioned a lot of it is an experiment a lot of it is you know, the learning can be that, that your business can be launched face by face, right? It's almost like now it's in toddler phase. So the good enough website I can have is like a quarter of what Etsy is right now. And that's enough to mm -hmm. launch my first 25 vendors, right? Like that's a reachable goal. It's like as long as the platform works to this degree, I can celebrate. And then when I get more money in, I can move to phase two. Now it has this sort of special layout, you know, or whatever that is the phase one, two, and three, and, and so forth. And to know that, hey, our business mm -hmm. is organic and grows with us as a human. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we got to ship faster. Right? We got to put things out there to actually be able to test things, to make those mistakes that we need to mm -hmm. make, improve things every single time, right? Which is awesome. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I really loved how blunt you've been in all of this, because this is sort of why I really wanted to have you on the show, because it wasn't just about, you know, I don't want you to talk about just the sugar plums and gumdrops of launching something big like this because it isn't. It's like the reality check is that there's all these different moving parts, as we mentioned, but also all these things that we have to learn about ourselves and about working with other people along the way that makes the difference between whether we enjoy the process of launching or we're like constantly just fighting it, you know, like which isn't fun at all and probably not why you started the business in the first place. So thank you so much for sharing all the raw stories, all the... <laughs> very honest advice, which I think is very real and very realistic. And I think people will really appreciate that from you. Um, so if the audience- I'm starting to regret it now. Oh no, you're not, it's all recorded. It's now, you know, forever online. <laughs> um, okay, so how do people find you online? So if they want to check out your um, eco-conscious business, learn about uh, what your website's about, maybe even reach out to you and say hello, where can they find you? Just go to getminimal.com. That's the easiest thing. Getminimal.com. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly spending my time doing the Facebook thing now. Again, that, that's another thing. People are going to tell you to open like four different social media accounts on different yeah. platforms, right? You won't be able to manage that. So just mm -hmm. pick one or at most two to start with that, that, that you can manage. So for me, it's the Facebook page. So mm. yeah, just search for Get Minimal and and you'll find me there um, I do a lot of content marketing or really not really content marketing I just like creating content so and and that's raising awareness uh, yeah. so, so so that's what I do so it doesn't matter whether you're a guy or a woman and um, whether you're into beauty products or not you know I just talk about lifestyle stuff so yeah. I like, I, like your, I like your videos on like, you know, the, the looking at products and really educating people about what is conscious buying and what to look for in the labels and all that stuff I think is super cool because most people are in the dark when it comes to looking mm. for that information. So it's not just only a place to buy products, but it's also a place that you can learn more about how companies can be more responsible, right? When, when yeah, exactly. Uh, is it awesome? And I think that is how... Yeah, sorry. And I, I, I was just going to say, I think that is how businesses can change the world. Mm. And, and that is why I choose to use business as a tool to further my work in animal welfare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I think that is the future of business as well, is to do good, in, do good and change the world. Oh, and on that note, that is a great last line. Uh, I love that you said <laughs> that. Thank you again, Elaine, for coming by and, and sharing your story and sharing all your tips. Um, and we will be featuring uh, Elaine's link in her video blog post. So look for that link as well on this video. Um, thank you again, Elaine, and uh, good luck on your launch and good luck on spreading that message of what you're passionate about and the cause that you are um, obviously valuing with your business across Asia and hopefully globally soon. Thanks, Elaine. Hey, thank you so very much for watching Screw the Cubicle TV and don't forget to subscribe below to get all the latest cubicle crashing content on how to quit your 9 to 5 and create a life and business on your own terms.